Lou Rockwell called me and asked me if I was still fully committed to the ideal of free speech, and I assured him that I was, and so he said, fine, come down and give one. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. This is a large group, given the nature of the one-time extremely narrow focus of Austrian economics. For those of us who've been around for a while, it's almost inconceivable that over 200 students would come out for a week from numerous countries from around the United States to spend the time devoting an entire week to a study of Austrian economics and its implications. 47 years ago, I attended a similar conference, much smaller, and out of that two-week period with a fraction of the students who were here uh, came my decision, my doctoral studies, came the decision of what I would devote most of the rest of my life to, and I even got a wife out of the deal. So I'm big on conferences of students. I think they can be turning points in someone's life. And one of the reasons why they are so important and why they have such a profound effect is that you get to survey a wide range of opinions and topics, but from a really narrow focus. And you can begin to see how, as Mises would say, a handful of axioms and some corollaries develop into a very powerful paradigm for the analysis of academic affairs, financial affairs, historical movements. It, it really is amazing the extent to which Mises' insights in Human Action 1949, read by so few people, would extend into so many different areas that really it's mind-boggling when you look at the, just the number of books that Mises.org has available for free, you almost could not get your college education done if you read all of it because of the, the enormous quantity of material that, have been, that has been put up by Jeff Tucker on the site. So it is a revolution. People use that phrase, but the web is a revolution in the same sense that Gutenberg's printing press was a revolution, an extension of Gutenberg over 500 years later. And I'm going to be talking about the implications of that transformation. But first, I want to get some terms defined. The essence of the presentation that I'm going to make is the difference between your occupation and your calling in life. And I define the calling in life as the most important thing that you can do in which you would be most difficult to replace. The occupation is easy to define. That's what puts food on the table. But the calling is much more difficult to assess because in most cases, there will not be a price tag attached to it that can be in any way assessed monetarily. But the price tag will be there, the benefits will also be there, but you will find it extremely difficult throughout the rest of your life to assess the effect of your calling, the importance of it, and whether you should really continue in it, precisely because there's no monetary assessment to it. Whereas with your occupation, you know. You know what you're gonna get paid. There's a contract, and assuming the company doesn't go belly up for the life of the contract, you're going to get a predictable amount of income. Your calling is not going to give you that. I was very fortunate. I knew what my calling was at the age of 18. I did not have a clue as to how I was going to achieve it, but I knew what it would be. I had bought a copy of Human Action from the Foundation for Economic Education, and it seemed like a real old book at the time. It was 11 years old. So I bought it. I began to read it. The first 170 pages on epistemology, I will admit, were daunting. But I began to read it, and I had read the Freeman for some time, and I, I, was, I was literate. I bought Hayek's Constitution of Liberty the same year, 1960, the year it came out. 
and I began trying to get through it, both, both of the books. And I decided I wanted to find out what the Bible specifically and Christianity in general had to say about economics and to what extent it was conformable to what I was reading in Mises and Hayek, to what extent it wasn't. I had no idea how I was going to achieve that. And I can assure you at the time that nobody had really thought about it, despite the fact that there was a tabloid magazine, or tabloid journal that came out every other week called Christian Economics. Mises wrote for it, other people did, Henry Hazlitt wrote for it. And it was funded by J. Howard Pugh, who was the founder, of, or not the founder, but the inheritor of Sun Oil, who was at the time the richest Calvinist on earth. And he put out that magazine, and almost every pastor in the country got a free copy of it. And I suspect 98% of them tossed it in the trash as soon as they got it. But there was no systematic effort in that tabloid to say to what extent Mises is or is not conformable to what the Bible says about economics. And Mises, as you know, did not think that religious issues had an impact on the content of economics. It was years after that. That was 1960. In 1973, my wife said, why don't you just sit down and write a commentary from Genesis to Revelation, specifically talking only about the economic issues? And I thought, that's a great idea. I think I could do that. I had a little book coming out, about a, one of my, my second book called Introduction to Christian Economics, and I thought, well, yeah, I really ought to do that because nobody's ever done that before. And I am very happy to announce, ladies and gentlemen, that in the next eight weeks, I actually may finish that commentary. <laughs> so long as you don't define finish as also writes the index. <laughs> and it, I have lost track of the size of it, but is approximately 10,000 pages at the present time. It's about 25 volumes long. Had she understood what she was challenging me to do, <laughs> she would have kept her mouth shut. <laughs> because it's, I've had to raise a lot of money to get it into print. It's spent an awful lot of the family time to get it done. But that volume, if you counted as one volume, no one has ever read, I'm conv completely convinced that no one's ever read my entire commentary, except me. <laughs> but that was the homework that I had to do for what will be, God willing, the final volume, which will be basically a, a human action type book on the topic. But you had to do your homework first. You had to look at the texts first. Nobody paid me to do that. I, I had to sacrifice whatever thousands of hours. I don't know. I know pretty much because I do 10 hours a week, 50 weeks a year since 1977. So I know in terms of the input side of it, what's gone into it. But as we Austrians know, it's not the input. It's not the, uh, it's not the labor theory of value that we're operating with here. <laughs> so. Now, why did I do this? Because that's my calling because nobody had ever done it, because nobody was crazy enough <laughs> to have attempted the thing, and that was my calling. And I, I knew something like that at the age of 18. That was 49 years ago. I knew kind of what my calling would be. I didn't know how I was going to get it done. Now, having said that, you have to assess at your age, why would anyone do it? And a lot of it's just, it's a, it's a personal calling. That's why they Call it a calling. That's why it has been called that. Men believe, Christians believe, God calls you to do something. But you have to respond, and so maybe it's just you calling you to do something. But you get this sense of, if not urgency, you get a sense of compulsion. And you think, this must be done, and nobody else is going to do it, and nobody else thinks it should be done, and I think it needs to be done. And nobody's going to pay you to do it. And that's, that's the important side of what I'm presenting this evening. I want to talk about a man who I personally knew and was a, a, a good friend of. His name was Bert Blummer, and he had a company called Camino Coin Company, and he died not too recently, well, not, not too far apart, did to die recently. What, three months maybe, something like that? 
whatever it was. They had a memorial for him Saturday. I couldn't come. Bert and I go back a long time. I think about 1965, maybe. A long time. Bert is a model of a life well lived. And let me tell you why. In his field of the buying and selling of coins, he was known for his unchallengeable morality. He ran a clean ship. Second thing he was known for, especially among his competitors, was price competition. He had really, really low premiums on his coins. He started that business in 1958. I I think he held it till probably a year and a half ago or so when he came down with cancer. So for essentially 50 years, he was a mainstay in the hard money movement for the buying and selling of bullion gold and silver coins. And he did a fine job, ran a tight, honest ship, did not waste a nickel, ran it unbelievably small given the large number of people he sold coins to over the years. He was a fine businessman, impeccable businessman. But that was only half of his life in terms of the calling and the occupation. And the other part of it was to find ways of helping libertarians get their message out to readers who would never otherwise have heard of that message. He was on the board of the Mises Institute. Before that, he was with the Center for Libertarian Studies. He really went out of his way to put his own money, his own wisdom, his own time on the line to promote a particular worldview that he was committed to and to give young people, younger people, bright scholars, an outlet for their materials that they would not otherwise have had. Now, that was a tremendous contribution given when he did it because there was nothing like the Mises Institute when he began helping get this movement into the, its second phase. And, and he got no publicity for it to speak of. He did not seek publicity for what he did. He did it because he was committed to it. It cost him money. It cost him time. He, he helped change a small segment of the world, and because of the fact that he, he backed Rockwell, he backed Rothbard at an important time, it is very clear that you would not be here, and probably most of you would never have heard of anything about the Austrian economics movement had it not been for the fact that Bert Blumert decided to spend half of his life with his calling rather than with his profession. So he had, he had two separate uses of his time. They were, they were consistent ideologically. Selling gold coins is certainly consistent with Austrian economic uh, analysis. But he didn't have to do it, it, the, the second half. He didn't have to do the calling. And he did it for decades. And you're here and I'm here because he did that. That is the model. Now, there was a model before him, even less known, and that is William Volcker. And Volcker was so paranoid about any publicity that the biographer who happened to work for the Volcker organization, years after he died, about five years, four or five years after he died, wrote the book about him called Mr. Anonymous. And William Volcker was a tremendously successful businessman selling something nobody pays any attention to, lampshades and, and window shades and flooring. And for over half a century, he was one of the dominant retailers in the Midwest of these products. They, he helped American families grow to provide really uh, fine quality products for homes of people who could not otherwise have afforded it. He always tithed from the 12 years old, he always gave away 10% of his income. And he was there in 1907 at the famous banker's panic of 1907 when it was a, it was a terrible recession. And people were out of work. He was in Kansas City, Missouri. He put up his own money to help people get back to work. Hundreds of people get back to work. He helped start a, a hospital to get it going. 
uh, to get uh, care for people in the community who couldn't afford it. He would never let anybody know he was doing any of it. And a man came to him and said, you know, this hospital work you've done, if the city could take this over, we could provide this care on a regular basis. And Volker thought, well, yeah, I, I can't fund it forever. I guess that's true. So the guy said, well, I'll, I'll help organize this. And the guy's name was Thomas Pendergast. Thomas Pendergast created one of the most powerful political movements in the Midwest. And because of Thomas Pendergast, an obscure politician by the name of Harry Truman was elected senator from the state of Missouri. And Volcker realized real early he had made a mistake. And so he began to support people and ideas who were committed to the free market. And his nephew was one of them. And he took over the Volcker organization about 1944. And among the things that Volcker organization did was to bring Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises into the circle, began supporting them because as you may know, neither the University of Chicago nor NYU would pay either of those men a dime because they did not, you see, meet the academic standards of New York University and the University of Chicago. So they were let alone. They were laissez-faire operation. They were allowed to stay on the campus as a kind of benefit, but not actually to pay them any money. And so Volcker and Earhart and some of the other foundations and private individuals whose pictures are on these walls raise the money so that those men could find an audience in the academic community. That's what it was in 1944 through the early 50s. That was the reality of it. And in Mises's case, he taught until 1966, if I remember correctly, if not late 60s, maybe 69. And he never was paid. The whole time, a visiting professor, Ludwig von Mises was regarded by the NYU faculty as a crackpot, as a strange Austrian man who had these strange seminars and who didn't meet the standards of that campus sufficient that they would pay him. Some of you are after an, an academic job. Legitimate. Somebody has to do the grunt work, somebody has to carry out the garbage, and somebody has to get tenure. You would like to get tenure and not carry out the garbage. I don't blame you. But the reality of the academic world is that for every quid, there is a pro quo floating around in the background. And the pro quo is, well, let's list a few of them. First, you will spend your entire career teaching students who don't know you and don't care a thing about you and who just want to get through get the degree, get the union card stamped, and out the door they go. A typical student was my father, who got a bachelor's degree back in 1940 from UCLA in business. And years later, I don't know how many years later, 30, sometime in the 70s, my dad mentioned that he had, he had studied, he remembered this class he'd had in money and banking, had vague memory of it by a guy named Anderson. And I stopped and I said, Benjamin Anderson? Yes, he said, that was the guy, Benjamin Anderson. Mm -hmm. And I said, you studied with Benjamin Anderson? Well, he said, I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know why my dad was unique? He remembered there was a Professor Anderson because the majority of the students who went through didn't remember there was a Professor Anderson. And this is the reality of it, that Three years after they're out, they don't remember you, probably. If you assign them a book that they happen to read and like, okay, but then for most of the classes, it's textbooks, which are books written by committees or books written to get through a committee with all of the, all of the excitement of a committee project. <laughs> so you run through hundreds of students over a career, but will any of them remember any of it? Will you actually get one, two, five, ten supreme students that you can look back and say, well, there I made a difference. That student, I made a difference with that student. Well, Mises had some. Rothbard was, but he wasn't enrolled. He was an auditor. And a lot of those bright guys who went through, they were auditors who came to the seminar. He let them in, but they weren't paying students. 
which is fitting because he wasn't a paid professor. <laughs> now you look at Mises. He wrote. He never got into the, into the academic world directly, except by support of the kindness of friends. Uh, University of Vienna never hired him. He, was, he worked for the equivalent of the, of the Vienna Chamber of Commerce. That's how he put food on the table. And that's how, in the early years, that's how Hayek put food on his table. Now, Hayek did get into academia. He, he was hired uh, by the London School of Economics in 1931. And Hayek did spend a long career in academia. But it was not the quality of the students that Hayek produced in most cases. In a few cases, yes, but in, in the most cases, if students came, students went. That's what students do. They come, they go. They move through the parade and they're out. They're gone and they don't remember. And they leave no trace. And most professors leave no trace. But what the job in academia gives you is this. Somebody pays you to read. And that is one of the great jobs of all time. Somebody will actually pay you a living wage to read. And you have to show up to class. And if you make tenure, you actually get to show up to class for years and years, uh, even if you're only barely functional. They don't fire you. You get to go through the motions. <laughs> You've had some professors like that. Everybody has had professors like that. They gave up the ghost at the age of 30, and they <laughs> punched their clock for the next 30 or 35 years. We, well, all of us have had professors like that. So I'm not opposed to academia as a way to put food on the table. I think it's a sensible way to do it. If you have the gift, you have the skill, you want to spend 10 or 15 years of your life that you could have been out in the market making some money and you do it as a graduate student. I did it. I've been there, done that. Wouldn't recommend it. Never went into academia as it turned out anyway. But I did go through it. I, I won't say I didn't learn. I did learn the discipline of going through it was important, but the most important thing that academia did for me is it forced me, absolutely forced me, to write an article every couple of months for the Freeman in order to pay for my career. And so I got on early with the Freeman, beginning in 1967, and the editor there happened to like my stuff, and he paid a lot more than most of my peers were getting. And I wrote my way into my first job, my first full-time job was with the Foundation for Economic Education. The way I got in it is that I was forced over a period of four years to keep cranking out the stuff. I had to put food on the table. And that was where I got my audience. And that was where I honed my skills at being able to write. Because it's like any other skill, you have to work at it. And getting paid to do it is a real benefit. You hear that, Rockwell? Getting paid is a real benefit. <laughs> anyway, so in my profession, in getting to my profession, in getting my union card stamped, I had to work on my calling. And the calling was to write. And specifically, it was to translate down what I had read of Mises and Hayek, Repke, and so forth, into language that was suitable for somebody who had just been handed a copy of the Freeman. And I'll tell you straight, it never happened to me again, but it happened to me once. My article came out in February of 1967, and I had met some guy somewhere. I'd, we'd gotten together, he had a younger guy. We were both young guys, and he invited me over to his house, his apartment. And he was sitting there and he said, have you ever heard of the Freeman? And I said, yes. And he said, let me show you this. And I said, look at the front cover of the Freeman. It was February of 67. Look at the front cover. And he looks down and he says, wait a minute. He says, that's you. I said, that's me. Never happened again. <laughs> but it happened once. And for a guy who writes, uh, that's a good thing. Writers do not write for a living. They live to write. That's what defines a writer. And that's what defines me. What you see is what you get. You live to write. If you get paid for it, that's good. Sometimes you don't. But the point is, you keep at it, because that's what you do. Now, I was fortunate. I was able to take my writing and, and move through the, to, to the Freeman uh, into a position at Fee under Leonard Reed, back in the good old days. And I didn't stay long, but it was a good experience. 
And I never stopped writing. I started my newsletter in 74. I still publish that newsletter. Uh, it's had ups and downs. I've had ups and downs, but an awful lot of money has come through my gates because of it. A lot of money's coming through it now. And I didn't do it for money, primarily. Didn't do it to starve, obviously, but I was able to find that I could write a newsletter and that people would pay me to read my stuff. And that was the great gift. I was not in an academic environment, but I still got people to send me a check in order to read what I had to write. And that's the perfect arrangement for a writer. Now, I look at you, most of you either starting out or pretty close to starting out, getting prepared, and I think, okay, what sensible advice can you get from an old guy who's been down the track when the technology was completely different and when the market was really very different? So you can learn a few things. The first thing that I want to get across to you is that you have an if not a moral responsibility, at least a social responsibility, to take advantage of the technology which has been delivered into your hands. And this technology, for all intents and purposes, did not exist prior to the development of the first web browser, which was back in the 90s. And the man, if you want a classic case of the greatest calling almost of the 20th century, it's Tim Berners-Lee. And how many people know who he is? And he never got a dime off of it. But he invented the HTML system, and the web exists off the internet because of what Tim Berners-Lee did. He changed the world. He really changed the world. Hardly anybody knows about him. Didn't get rich off of it, but he changed the world. That was his calling. He did as a sideline project. He was employed by a technical institute over in, in Switzerland, and he developed what became the web. Because of what he did, it is now possible in our time what was never possible in the history of the human race, we have shut down the gatekeepers. And there was one event that announced it, one archetype event which will go down in American history and really should go down in world history as a significant announcement of an entire new world order. And that event took place in 1998 when an obscure, unmarried guy operating out of an apartment down in Los Angeles, California, who spent most of his time an announcing how movies were doing, found out that an article at Newsweek magazine had been spiked, which is, that is, buried. And the article was on a White House intern. And he went online and he said, Newsweek has killed an article about some girl who works for the White House who's been involved in some way sexually with Clinton. By the end of the week, Newsweek took it off the spike. And that was the announcement. That meant that a nobody out of nowhere, geographically speaking, nobody out of nowhere through the instrument called the World Wide Web could basically break the stranglehold of information that was controlled by those organizations that had the paper and the ink. A.J. Labeling, back in the, probably in the 1970s, an anarchist sort, leftist, clever man, made this wonderful statement. He said, freedom of the press is magnificent if you own one. <laughs> now we own one. Everybody in this room, in effect, can own one with only an investment of time. You can go on Blogger. You can go on the WordPress site. You can start a blog at any time. For five bucks a month, they'll even take the ads off of it. You can start a website. You can get a domain for 10 bucks a year. You can go to Host Monster or Host Gator that will host all the domains you want for a flat rate of $8 or $6 a month. Flat rate. All the domain names you want. You can have sites on any specialty. You can set up sites for Interaction, in other words, the forums. Forum sites are extremely popular. You can advance your career. Probably nobody's going to see you for a long time. They won't see you. But over time, because of Google, primarily because of Google, but because of the other search engines, people begin to find you. It is the operation, in a sense, as never before in history of what knock 
called back in 1937 Isaiah's job, speaking of the remnant. And he said the remnant will find the person that represents the remnant, but the remnant will not identify itself. The remnant will not respond to hustle and hype. The remnant will find you. Now, Nock believed it. And in that famous essay that almost everyone in this room should read, I mean, there are certain essays you read, I Pencil by Leonard Reed, Knox, Isaiah's Job. You read those essays. You internalize those essays. And Knox's essay seemed incredible in 1937. Today, it is reality. It's called the long tail, T-A-I-L. And the long tail phenomenon means over time, people with a particular interest will find you if you have anything reasonable to say that appeals to them. And they won't identify themselves, usually. They probably won't pay you any money, at least not at first, but they will find you. This has never happened before. It's, it's only an investment of time now. The marginal costs of finding you are essentially zero. And the marginal costs of getting the message out, other than your time, are essentially zero. This has never happened before in human history. Yeah, they're gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are at the gates, the walls are down. <laughs> and there's almost no air. There are only a few areas left where the gatekeepers are still in control. Hollywood, because of the extraordinary cost of doing a movie. But that's dropping because of the technology. That really is beginning to drop. And you've got, for example, if you've not seen Blip TV, Blip.TV, this has created a free site for creative basically young people with pretty reasonably priced technology to produce the equivalent of TV shows or even short movies. Free. Post them so anybody can find them. You can allow ads on it if you want to share the money uh, from the ads. You can, so you can conceivably make money at the deal. The other, of course, is the university system. And that's done through one thing only. The only way they can hold it now is what they've used from the beginning of the 20th century, and that is the accreditation system the right to say, I'm a college, I'm a university, and grant a degree. That's controlled by the government. That's a license handed out. That they still control. But that's going to break. That's going to break. Phoenix University, let's face it, Phoenix University has shown what's ahead. Do you know how many kids are enrolled? Kids? You know how many people are enrolled at Phoenix University at, what, 10 grand a pop? 300,000 of them. And there's one entrepreneur who's got the vision, He's got four of these colleges now. He goes around to existing colleges that are going belly up. What have they got? They got nothing but debt and an accreditation certificate. This guy's buying them up. Pennies on the dollar. He's buying them up. He's going to give Phoenix a run for the money. Accredited degrees by mail. So even that gate is beginning to break down because of the technology. When you get essentially zero marginal cost to do something, you're going to break down the barriers. There is no way they can resist that magnificent word, that great word, free. And that's what Jeff Tucker is doing with Mises.org in the literature section of the site. The great books of the libertarian movement, one by one, are coming onto that site. You can download them for free, and if they have the right to sell it, you can buy it for 20 or 25 bucks if you want to buy the book. What happened? Free sells books. Free sells books. People don't like to read on screen. People don't like to print them out. People don't like to get a three-hole punch and stick them on the shelf, and they're that tall. People don't like I do. I'm cheap, but most people, <laughs> most people don't do that, right? So what do they do? They buy the book. They've got what I call, and you can read this. This is one of my, my great contribution to culture. In fact, if you search Google, mine is the top, the top listing. I've, def I've defined a psychological symptom. It's called Picard's Syndrome. If you read Picard's Syndrome, you'll see what I'm talking about. Jean-Luc Picard was the amateur, well, what do you He was the amateur archaeologist, right? All through this, was there, did you ever see a book? on the Starship Enterprise. No one had a book. But they'd knock at his door, they'd have that funny noise, and he'd say, you know, enter or whatever it was. And he'd be reading a book. They'd look. They, didn't, they didn't laugh at him. He was reading a book. Because some people have to have the book in their lap. If it's not a book in their lap, they're not happy. They got Picard syndrome. I, I'm not going to tell you how many people 
weak, weak people. The, this, the Mises Org sells their, their monthly fix of printed books to, but it's extraordinary how many books run through this outfit because they're putting them free at the front end. This is taking place in that famous phrase, under the radar. And one thing happened all of a sudden to pull it above the radar. And everybody in the room knows what that thing was. An obscure physician from Texas said, I'm going to run for president of the United States. And all of a sudden, millions and millions of people realized they weren't crazy alone anymore. <laughs> And Ron Paul, it's it's extraordinary. People, I mean, people just just simple people, blue collar people, workers that you never. Some guy, I was in a hotel and he was putting in, he was reloading the the free popcorn, just reloading free popcorn. He said, "Well, what do you think about that?" And it was some crazy, always oh, some bailout, some crackpot lunatic scheme that passed. What do you think about that? I don't think it was any good. Well, I don't think it was any good either. Then the guy said, you know what I did? I, you ever heard of Ron Paul? <laughs> said, yeah, I've heard of Ron Paul. Well, I, Ron Paul, I like Ron Paul. Well, this happens just all the time. This happens all the time. Why? Because the technology is decentralizing. It's on our side. Technology is moving in our direction. Communications technology is moving in our direction. And it's moving very fast. In fact, it's moving so fast, the feds can't control it, which is really good. Because by the time they have any kind of a system to control it, it's obsolete. It's gone. And, and we know that sites all over the world, they're setting up imitations of Mises.org. They're setting up what are the, 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 uh, the uh, shadow sites, right? Stealing the information. You know what ha that means? What government can shut down Mises.org? They could shut it down and within seconds, there are 10, 15, 20 more back up. They can't shut it down. The gatekeepers are helpless at this point because of the technology of the web. Now having said this, what about for you? Sometimes you can make the web pay. I am living proof. Uh, you, can, you can create an audience. It can strengthen your business. It can strengthen your reputation. And even if you're an academia, it can make you famous. Let me give you two examples. Juancole.com. First-rate scholar, University of Michigan. Field of study is, is uh, Islamic studies in the Middle East. So we have a little war going on. He starts commenting on Iraq. He can speak the language, reads the language. People from Iraq start sending him information. They can send him information through the web. He starts commenting on what's going on. All of a sudden, Juan Cole is the most famous scholar in the country on the area of Iraq. Why? Because he put up a blog, and he is a scholar. But he's not a famous scholar because he's at the University of Michigan and tenured. He's a famous scholar because he started a blog. Now let me give you another example. Keynesian. Guy really doesn't like us. Brad DeLong, Berkeley. Now he admits that he's spending most of his time now on his blog site. Enormous audience. He's probably the most famous economics professor at Berkeley at this stage. Not because of anything he's written for a scholarly journal, not because of any definitive book that he has written, but because he started a blog. So it reinforced his career. Now maybe you better, maybe better have tenure before you do this, possibly. Because, uh, you know, at least you're under the radar. When you get onto the web, it's a little hard to stay off the radar, especially if somebody's after you. But the reality of it is that the web itself can strengthen your position in the classroom and take your message far, far beyond that handful of students who are barely staying awake during your lectures. And it gives you a little hope. Anybody see Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Anybody seen that movie? Do you remember? Do you remember the scene? <laughs> Do you, and then the scene we all remember. When Ben Stein is lecturing to the kids and, and he's going on. I'm in, I'm in the theater. This is 25 years ago. I'm in the theater. And he says, Do you, 
before the Great Depression. What happened before the Great Depression that sent it into the Great Depression? Anyone? Anyone? I go to my wife, Smoot Hawley Tariff. <laughs> Stein says, Smoot Hawley Tariff. And he says, now, what about taxation policy? What about taxation policy? What's the rule when you lower the rate of taxation? What happens to revenues? Anyone? Anyone? And I turn around, Whaffer Curve. She says, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they have that, they have the one kid who's got his head down and he's got a thing of spaghetti and saliva going out. I, I know that kid. I had that kid in my class. I had dozens of kids in my classes in the time when I was a teaching assistant. It had that same effect. But when you've got a blog or a website, when you're on Google, do you know of the Khan Academy? Who knows of the Khan Academy? K-H-A-N, Salman Khan. Nobody, right? It is unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable. The guy is an MBA, I think, out of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he's got some advanced degree, master's or something in engineering. And he's got this site. And on this site, he takes you from 1 plus 1 equals 2 to advanced calculus and calculus-based physics in 800 lessons free. Does the whole thing through Google. Free. And he spends, I think I read, he says like three hours to get a, an eight or nine minute presentation. He gets it exactly right. Now that's his calling. Now he's been hired. He's worth some high tech outfit. Fine. I'm sure he's making a buck. He's not, in terms of making a buck off that side, he's making nothing. I guess they have a few ads for some books or something, but basically he's not making any money off that site. But he has made available to homeschoolers the greatest site on the web for finally mastering mathematics. Free! And he's done this truly under the radar. The homeschool movement is, is getting more aware of it for obvious reasons, because the mothers after about the second semester of, of freshman algebra are saying, I don't remember any of this stuff. So the answer is you send him to Salman Khan's site, Khan Academy, and he's going to teach you. This is just the beginning of what can be done. So what I would recommend to you is this. You go home after this thing, and you think, what is the most important thing that I can do in which I would be most difficult to replace? It may be some really narrow topic. Become the master of that topic. In 30 years, they come to you, even if they don't like you, because you are the master of the topic. Now, I think... If, you, if you're smart enough to be a Rothbard, then you go into the broad general areas. And with, in case of Rothbard, he goes into the specialized areas and he's better than 95% of the guys in the field. He was unbelievable as to what he could do. We're not Rothbards. But what you can do is find one niche in which you can apply what you're really committed to. And especially if you can apply what you've learned at this conference, you can do that one niche topic. You get books, you get articles. You get traffic. And you can, you can make a few bucks selling Google ads, maybe. You can make some money if you get enough traffic. It's not, uh, it's not guaranteed a nonprofit deal. But, but carve out your niche and spend 40 or 50 years on that niche. You don't have to put three hours a day in on it. Think about it. Do book reviews. What if all you do is to take a narrow area of, of, of interest and you review, intelligently review, all the books that are coming out in that field. They're going to come to, they got to come to you. Because everybody's lazy. I don't want to read the book. They don't want to read the book. I don't want to read that book. It's 800 pages long. Why do they write these long books? I'll go to this guy's site. He's read the book. He'll give it to me in a thousand words or so. They trust you. And the trust element is so important. They trust you. And all you got to do is get online and say something reasonably accurate that will save other people time, They, if you make it easy, they will come. Because people are lazy. You can't master everything in every field. You're looking for two or three sites. Actually, they know now about 14 sites. Beyond 14 sites, they drop a site to go to a new site. People are clogged up. They know the sites they go to. They go to those. Very hard to get somebody to go to a new site. But if the person finds a narrow area topic that he's really interested in, and he finds that you can help him do better in that field, he will come, and he will tell friends. 
And I'm not the first one who coined the phrase, but about 12 years ago I did coin it, and the phrase is word of mouth. And word of mouth is an incredibly powerful tool today. The Google movies that are shown, that once in a while those, those cheap homemade whatever they are, the kid playing the guitar with the, with the baseball cap, and he's looking down and you can't see his face. I saw it when it had a million hits. It had only been on a month. A million hits. Last time I checked, it was 60 million hits. And it took the New York Times six months to find out who he was. Unbelievable that that could happen. Whole careers are being launched off of YouTube. I am saying that if you can find that job that will enable you to read, that's a great job. Do what you can to get that job. If you can teach some students, make life easier for the students, that's a good thing to do too. Don't expect them to be significantly better than the kids in Ferris Bueller, but a few of them may be, a few of them may be. And you'll get that one or two in a year, three, four, that really are good and you really do make a difference. At least you think you do. And if you have a website, you can keep that communication with that student. But the key to it is not, in almost all cases, the job. It is not your occupation in which you make your legacy. It is your calling. And they probably won't pay you to do that. And so I'm, I'm calling you to find that narrow area where you can say, I can make a, dif a, a real difference, and I probably can't be replaced. And if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. And that's what you work on. And you do it for 20 years, 30 years. You, you don't stop. As the Bible says, you put your hand to the plow and you don't look back. Now, you can drop a project if you really think, no, I really hate this. Okay, drop it. But on the web, it stays up forever. And if you can find some bright, energetic person who got interested in it and say, look, I'll give the site to you. You take the site. Take my name of it. You take it. You run with it. You take it over. I don't want to do it anymore. That's okay. That's legit. That's a legacy. But what I'm saying is the technology is in your lap. I mean, literally with these lap books, lap, I mean, the, these cheap two, three hundred Linux-based computers, it's unbelievable what you've got, and it's only going to get cheaper. There's no reason technically why you shouldn't do it. There are reasons financially. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you time. So here's the secret. Here's the secret. Go home, go to the television set with a pair of wire clippers and clip the wire. <laughs> After you've unplugged the wire, of course. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I, in 1974, made a vow, secondary marriage vow, and we said at that time, we will, except for the news shows or, or a documentary, we will watch no television unless somebody pays for it. And the, the, we agreed to 25 cents per half hour. Now, admittedly, the dollar was more, worth more back then. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was maybe a dollar, dollar and a half for a half hour. And the moment we put a dollar in a, and we, we put it in a pile, we put it in a, in, a, in a little bowl, and then we give the money away at the end of the month. We give the money away. Okay? So a buck a show. You know, do you know how much time that cut off the TV watching? There wasn't anything worth watching except Mary Tyler Moore and Bob Newhart. I paid for Mary Tyler Moore, she paid for Bob Newhart. <laughs> and if you go and if you go on Hulu today, they're sti they still hold up. They're still as funny as they were then. Very few shows do hold up. They do. All it took was just peanuts to say it's my time is not free. And the moment we put a dollar a half hour in effect of today's money, that was it. We wouldn't watch it anymore. TV will eat you alive. TV is the greatest lie in the history of man. It says that this is free time, and there is no free time. Time is the only irreplaceable resource. Don't let anything convince you ever that you've got free time. It is never free. There's recreation time. There's legitimate escape. You've got to shut down so many hours a day. Sleep is important, but it's not free. Find that area, that niche, that something that you want to commit to, where you're going to be in 30 years, you're going to be the man, you're going to be the woman. That's going to be your area in which you have committed to it, and they've got to come to you, and not because you're an academic community, but just because you're the best out there.
and find the area in which you're going to be the best out there if you, if you spend 20 to 30 years doing it a little bit each day. Lou Rockwell built lourockwell.com off, of off of a blog, just a blog site. Well, gee, I'm interested in this. I'll post a link. Look at it now. Look at the effect of it now. This can be done. There's no legitimate reason, I believe, that it shouldn't be done. I don't care what you get for your job. If you can get somebody to pay you full time to read, well, that's just terrific. More power to you. At least they'll treat you better than they treated F.A. Hayek and better than they treated Ludwig von Mises. They'll, tr they'll treat you better than that. Hayek and Mises didn't make it because of the classroom. They made it because they were the best guys writing the best material at the time that they did the writing. I challenge you that that is your assignment too. Don't worry about the job. Commit yourself to the calling. Thank you very much.